All right, well, good morning, Mr. Spencer. My name is Ron Bohan. Ron Bohan. Yes, Bohan, yep. Bohan. Yes, sir. And uh, I'm a volunteer here. My at real the... name is Ernest W. Spencer, Jr. My nickname is Eddie. Out there's part of the story. I'll tell I got that name. So would you like me to call you Eddie today? Yeah. I'd be glad everybody, to. Please call me Ron. If anybody calls me Ernest or Ernie, they're from <laughs> Michigan. Gotcha. Oh. <laughs> gotcha. So I'm a volunteer here at the Collierville Museum. And in that way, I've been interviewing some World War II veterans like yourself. I've had a great honor to do that. I'm a ex-military myself. I was in the Navy um, in the <laughs> 80s. I was yeah, a sonar tech. I was a Highland with... Uh, uh, oh, you know, Diane Height. I uh, don't know her. She has this veterans program. Oh, I do know her, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, I, I was served in, in the 80s in the Navy. So that's one reason I'm especially honored to interview today. And so, could you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your family, where you grew up, and those kind of things? Yes, I was born on July the 25th, 1920, in Ferndale, Michigan, which is two, I was two blocks north of the Detroit city limits where I was born. And I've lived around in Michigan, uh, Port Huron, which is a, my favorite place in the world, up on the Great Lakes. And uh, I went to school there, and that's where I drafted from there. My mother was living in Rochester, Michigan, just out of Detroit. My grandparents were all truck farmers in in Michigan, and all they were all German, and uh, on my mother's side of the family, and they they did all their produce in down in uh, in Detroit, and in the little towns around Detroit. So I I, I worked in Detroit. I did defense work. To, and uh, long before the war came out. And how old were you when you were drafted, sir? I was, uh, I turned 21 in July and I was drafted and uh, went into service in, uh, you know, December the 7th. Now, well, I mean, after the war. Do you remember your draft number? Yeah, 36527587. Nice. <laughs> I don't remember my right one on the wall. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so uh, you were in the Army. Army. Yep, and you got drafted into the Army, or did you choose I that service? I, I was drafted. I wasn't brave enough to be <laughs> to enlist, I guess. And so tell me, do you recall when you found out that your draft number was called and you were, had been drafted? Where were you when you I was working for Miller Brass Company and doing defense work in Port Huron, Michigan. And what went through your mind when you realized that you had been drafted? Well, my father was in World War I. Was he, was he Army? In the Army. He was a machine gunner. And they sent him to England, and England sent him to Russia as a machine gunner. Wow. Because they were allies back then. Right. He was in the 339th Polar Bear Division in uh, wow. Ar Archangel, Russia. Wow. Uh, he he gave me advice. He says, "Son, he said, don't don't ever uh, just make a lot of noise, sir. Don't ever uh, uh, volunteer for anything. Yeah. Let them pick you out for it. And they did pick you out, huh? Yeah, they picked me out. <laughs> so that you were drafted in the army. Now, what did your um, mom and dad say? Are the rest of your? Do you have siblings, brothers and sisters? Do you have brothers and sisters? I have a, a brother was in, in Okinawa in World War II, and my son is Vietnam. Wow. So what did your uh, family say? Do you recall what they said when they learned that you had been drafted? Well, they just knew I was going into service. Yeah. My mother told me back in 1934, she said, son, she's just going to be a war and you're going to be in it. I never forgot that. She was right. She was right. I wish everybody else was uh, yeah. as smart as she was at that yeah. point. Could have avoided some problems. So you um, were drafted into the Army, and where did you go to boot camp? Boot camp? Yes, sir. Well, I went to Detroit. They took us to Detroit for a physical. I went with three guys, friends. One, one of them uh, uh, 
was they didn't draft him, and the other one could he had a, a ear trouble or what do they what do they call that when you can't hear or have uh, adenoid not adenoid but uh, something wrong with yeah that, is with he that. Any, yeah, he had, yeah 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 and the other one uh, was blind in one eye we we went down to to go to the navy to join the navy and they wouldn't take all three of us wow so I was drafted good. So um, then you went to, did you go to artillery school? I went school? to Camp Hill in Texas. I went to Camp Custer in Michigan first, and they put us on a train and took us down to Camp Custer. Had you been on a train before at that point? Was no, I don't believe I had. They had my first trip. <laughs> yeah. So then you went to artillery school for the night. You went to artillery school for the... Um, Oh, well, I took, the first, back then we took 13 weeks of basic training. Right. And uh, I went to Camp Hill, Camp Hill in Palacios, Texas, and took uh, we took a train, 13 weeks. I applied for uh, OCS, the Officer Training School, right. and I passed, but they didn't they didn't accept me. We got shipped out. They shipped us to up to. Uh, Camp Shelby in Mississippi for advanced training after the 13 weeks. Right. On the howitzer? On the 90 millimeter? On the 90 millimeter. We were, we were strictly an aircraft at that time. Okay. So that's fascinating. So you went through all your training and then you find yourself, I imagine, on a troop transport to Europe? Yeah. Then it took us to, up to Massachusetts for one week and they took all our clothing away from us. Gave us all impregnated clothing. You know what that is? Was that for, for insects? Gas. But oh, for, for gas. gas, right, right. <laughs> and they and they took all our silver money away, bills away from us, gave us gold money. We left once that one night. We left there, went down to New York, and Staten Island, got got on a ship, and we shipped over to twelve days going across the Atlantic because we had to do this. For the submarines, I heard heard uh, you know sh uh, shooting at the submarines a few times, but none of our ships got lost. We had 26 ship convoys. In the convoy, over. we went through the Straits of Gibraltar and landed in Oran, North Africa, the port. Was that uh, was Morocco? Like, Is that Morocco? Morocco, huh? Yeah. And on a Sunday afternoon, when we landed, they put us on trucks and took us to a staging area called Gold Hill. So tell me a little bit about when you land in Morocco. That must have been just amazing for you. I mean, a, a well, young man I, I, from I was, Michigan and, and now I, in Morocco. I was, I was a little like this. That barracks bag was full of <laughs> clothing and everything, and they had to help me up the gangplank. I was little, <laughs> yeah. couldn't hardly get up there. Anyway, they took us to Gold Hill. Now this a couple of funny things happened at Gold Hill. <laughs> Goat Hill's in Morocco. That's in Morocco. Yes, yeah, sir. it was a staging area. Yep. <laughs> but remember, you couldn't dig a hole in the ground because it was all boulders and stuff. We put pitched a tent. We we shared shelter house with another guy. The friend um, that I was with, or you know, uh, uh, another soldier. We tied our shelter house together. He was a Syrian, kind of big, big guy. Not in the U.S. Army. He was in the army. Oh, okay. He was Syrian. Oh, I see. Senate, you know, he said it. Anyway, he had hair all over his body. He was just covered with hair. I believe he had hair on the bottom <laughs> of his feet. <laughs> they share it with with him and I, our tents. Uh, the funny part is we had to do calisthenics, so there yeah. wasn't much level ground. We had to get up there and do our exercise. We all wore shorts. Well, he came out bare naked. <laughs> Did he look like he was wearing a hair suit, like yeah. a fur coat? Oh, he jumped up and down, and he caught hell when a sergeant raised <laughs> came with him. Boy. <laughs> so you, so then um, you were in Morocco for a staging area, um, and then, right, then we, were, we were assigned to go back toward Casablanca to an uh, ammunition dump. We were protecting an ammunition dump, and Tim was in. North Africa. So that was your first our first like, assignment. Duty, assignment was to protect right. the ammo dump. To protect the ammo dump, aeroplane, you know, shoot aeroplanes down. Right. 
Now, did uh, you have an occasion then to fire at enemy aircraft? I mean, did oh, the... Oh, yeah, they, well, whenever they came around. But going back to our staging area, we, when we first got there, we had to dig a slit trench. You know what yep, slit trench sure is? Yeah, for a little retreat. Well, I brought a, brought a tank or, in there with the water, and we all got diarrhea. Oh, nice. That thing really got used. <laughs> well, yeah, I, about two days after we were there, the Germans came to bomb mount the ships in the part of Iran. We didn't know the difference. You know, that was our first baptism of fire. Airplanes flying, an old German plane, caught in the spotlights and stuff, we were being shot at. And were you manning the uh, the 90 millimeter at that point? Huh? Were you manning your gun? No, no I, well, yeah, our outfit was. I didn't man the guns. I'll tell you what I did. Yeah, I'm curious, yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, we didn't know the difference. We thought they were bombing us or because eight miles away from the port is not very far for an aeroplane. Yeah. Scared the devil out of us. I bet. When it was all over, <laughs> some some private hollered out, it was dark, hollered out, oh, you officers get out of that slit trench, the war's over. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, they didn't jump in the slit trench? No, slip. no, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And uh, that was one of the comical things that happened. Well, we went to the Antemel ship, and there was two things that happened that I was, I didn't care for in the service. Two of them, that question was asked, two things you remember that was good for you. And I remembered those four things. The two things were, I went to this little town of Antemel ship, and it was an Arab town, but it was run by the French. I wasn't Catholic at the so they had a Catholic church there, but a bunch of us went to, the, went to a Catholic church. Just, right. just went there to go to church. And uh, I went past this butcher shop, and, uh, and uh, there was no refrigeration. The meat was hanging up, yeah. and uh, yeah. it was hot weather in North right. Africa. You know, flies were around mm -hmm. up and everything. Uh, the, up against the building was a little old Arab woman. She looked to be 100 years old. And a little old skinny arms, a lot smaller than mine. Legs no bigger around than my wrist. Sitting up there wrapped in a burlap bag. That was her clothing. And they had thrown her a raw ox tail. And still had the hair on it and the, you know, the skin and everything. She, she didn't have any teeth, but she's out there gnawing on that tail. Wow. I never, that never left, left my mind. I, I see wow. that so many times. Yeah. So did you have a chance to talk to her, or you just oh, saw no, her? Oh, no, you couldn't, know. Right, because the language... She was just like a, a dead person there. Wow. Just, just was gone at it. Anyway, we left there, and we went went back through Iran. We chased the Germans, firing at the arrow, you know, at aeroplanes. So let me, let me pause for a minute. So tell us what your job was. What was your job in... Um... My first job, uh, when I went into service, the, the chaplain needed an assistant. And I knew that the sergeants, at, the sergeants were tough. They had to give us the training. <coughs> they had to do what they said. But they weren't mean, nasty, mean work. Because we carried rifles overseas, you right, know. Right, right. It wasn't be easy to kill one of them in a battle. They knew that. Yeah. But... The, how, what was I going to well, say? Well, you were saying your job was the assistant to oh, the chapel. I know that the sergeants, people like that, are a little careful around the religious, around the minister. He was a Baptist minister from, from uh, New Mexico, and I accepted the job. Half a day I took my training, and half a day I went to the church. And I, I couldn't type, but I typed with two fingers. I typed the sermons, excuse me, stuff like that. They gave me a little rest. So I was protected pretty good. Nice. I, I go yeah. get my meals, whatever it was time, you know, and everything. I didn't have any extra duty other than that. Well, when I got overseas, and, and being, being a chaplain's assistant, we got on that ship, I didn't have to go, 12 hours you had to stay below deck, 12 hours you had to stay up on the deck. 
Right. Had so many troops on there. And I had a pass to go back to the line for food because I, I kept the office open, the chaplain's office open. And, and I uh, handed out the cards and the dice. And I had met a fellow that could play cribbage, and I sit there and play cribbage all day. That's long. good duty. Yeah. Yeah, that's good <laughs> duty if you can get it. So I was protected there. Yeah. So. Um, and when we got yeah. got to Antemochet, I the chaplain was gone to the batteries, the gun batteries all the time. I was at headquarters. He was going to the batteries all the time, where because the, he was the colonel and him were setting up the batteries different places, and. Uh, they made me uh, colonel's orderly. Well, he was gone. I didn't run nothing to do. He didn't have no shine shoes because he was out in the war. All they did was make up his bed, and, and I had the whole day. That's why I was able to go into town to Antem Nice. Where I saw that right. thing there. But then we left there. And we went. We pushed the Germans all the way across. Got as far as uh, Tunis. Yep, Tunis. Uh -huh. We got on ships. And we went to Sicily. We landed in Palermo, Sicily, and they took us to back to ten, to a town named Termini, which is about twenty miles away. Well, uh, my best buddy was a, was the friend, head friend chef of the Kearney Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. He was ten years older than me. I met him at Camp Shelby, and we became real close friends. So we shared. He had a foxhole here, and I had my foxhole. We shared a tent when we weren't being shelled, and <laughs> so, so what, what I, is it I, like? I want to ask you, what is it like to be shelled? You mentioned that. And the, what is that like? It's it's hell, because you saw my papers. We had 550 straight days of combat and without I saw relief. That. Yeah, that was what it was like. Every day being shelled out. That missed me. That's shrapnel. Wow. Now where did you, that, where did that, you pick this I up? Was, I, I, was, uh, I was at a foxhole big in a side, at the casino in, in a, an old dry riverbed. And we were dug in. Is this in Sicily? All I did in Sicily from the very bottom to the very top. That's where we got out of 550 days. Yeah. And. Uh, I was in in the dugout, uh, and it was bit it wasn't dug too deep in the side of a bank, a hill hillside, so we had sandbags up. Well, we made it, made it big enough to put army cots in there. We slept my buddy and I. He had one, and I had one. Now you're living the life. Now you yeah. got a cot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and it was a protected thing, and uh, they were, oh, we, we were the ones that. Uh, Start this outfit. Remember reading in the book where in the papers where the fella spotted that truck ten miles away. Yes. All right. He called a shell. They dropped the ninety millimeter and aircraft down and shot and blew that truck all to pieces and killed all the people there. Then they spotted the Germans in the farmyard yard and they had them lowered to 20, 20 yards down over top of them and it killed all the Germans in the, in the in there. And word got back to the Fifth Army about what he had done. And from because, then on, let me just restate, so the reason that's relevant and important is because before that they really hadn't used anti aircraft ordinance against land targets. That's right. Right. So this we, was we, a, a new four hundred and third change of history of the Western Front. Right. That's that's what the they said. And what was your job at that point? Were you you were the uh, I was I was with the with the staff then. I was cooking with him. You were cooking. We were moving every almost every day, and I was cooking in the back of a truck. We had our stoves in the truck. In the back, I was the driver of the truck. <laughs> we were on the move. I bet. When we got to the casino, we stayed there for for a while. So let me. Can I ask you uh, maybe what's a, a sad question, and we can just touch it but so you're being shelled and I imagine you're taking casualties is that right you're taking casualties men are getting hurt oh, yeah. or killed what, what was that like to one of my best friends uh, that I met in, in Camp Hewlett Texas in basic training from Missouri 
Yeah. Steve, we, I call him Steve, and they're Steven's last name. Right. Uh, they, was, they were being shelled, that b b particular battalion, I mean, the battery he was in, I don't know if it was A, B, or C, or D, I don't know which one. <laughs> he was going out and getting the wounded and helping, and the shell bursted behind him, and they blow his back off. Oh, man. And, well, that's but uh, after we started doing this, dropping the guns down 90 millimeters a long time, at the troops on the ground, when you know, we moved to the front, then we were uh, changing the history, like I said, of World War II on the Western Front. Right. And I, did I read that you fired, or your battalion fired over 100,000 shells? 115,000 shells, more than that, at just the ground troops. Not counting the air. That's amazing. Four batteries with four guns in each. Right. Oh. That's crazy. So you're the you're you're cooking now, and you're moving with with the battalion throughout Sicily, All from right. one theater to the other. So you're moving now. How long did you stay in Sicily? Did you didn't move? I heard that you were in the Po Valley of Italy. Oh Virginia. yeah, the Po Valley was the last thing. We we landed uh, like I said down at the bottom of Italy. We convoy went into to Salerno, Salerno worked our way up to Naples. From Naples, and up are up. you fighting the whole way up? Yeah, we were shoot, shooting at the German troops. That's what our job was then. We we weren't considered a dual air outfit then until we pulled away, and then we were dual outfit. So, uh, but in the in the north in the southern part of Italy. Then you were doing close-in fire support for the infantry groups? Yeah, we were supporting infantry. Right, right. Yeah. Until, and we worked our way up. I noticed my papers. I got copy from papers. Not this one, I got them. That's all right, we'll talk about it. Let's just yeah, tell yeah. me about it. We got, what, San Pietro. That was up above, uh, between Casino and, and, and Naples. We were fired uh, for a couple days constantly at San Vittorio and San Pietro. And San Pietro, when we, we pulled up there on a hillside and set up and shooting, that's where we saw a lot of German dead equipment and stuff because we killed them. <coughs> San Pietro was just up on the road. We were down below the road in a olive orchards and stuff because we use olive tree branches for covering our foxholes and stuff. Oh, right, right. And uh, Pam San Pedro was up there. I walked up there to San Pedro. There wasn't a building left. I don't know how many where the people got out of there ahead of time. They and, probably did because they, yeah. yeah. But so it, can it, I, let me ask you a question about, you mentioned that when you were traveling you would see you know, dead Germans and blown up equipment, right? Yeah. And so I wonder, you mentioned earlier that your family is from Germany. Your your mom oh, and dad are no, from Germany? No, good gosh, no. Even my great-grandparents weren't from Germany. Oh, I'm sorry. They're, they're, their parents were. I, my great-grandfather came from Germany. He must have been a rebel because he, he left uh, some city in Germany and went to Russia. And left Russia and come to Poland. His name was M I K O L, last name Michael. He had an O L O W S K I on the end of it. We got the Polish name. People always thought we were Polish. Right. <laughs> the people did that a lot. Then. Yeah. Yeah. So. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Okay. So, but what? How? What was your? How did it feel? I mean, what did you think and feel when you would see, you know, uh, dead Germans? Well, that was a good feeling. That wasn't a, wasn't a bad feeling. Right. Because <laughs> like, that was what you were supposed to be doing. Yeah. Right. Right. So, uh, while well, we were at the casino, we stayed at the casino. We were down in the dry riverbed, a little town along the riverbed. We were on the back of it, down in the... That's where I dug in. We spent quite a bit of time there because it was a stalemate with the Gothic line, I think. Yep. And stalemate is there for a while. Now that's a very mountainous area right there, yeah. isn't it? Well, I, well, we could look from our riverbed, look right here, two and a half miles away was Mount Abbey, up in a mountain casino was just down there. 
the river done it. It just it just looked like across looking across the field with my right clothes. That day I wasn't on duty. I was late. I laid up on the river bank, on a dry river bank, watch six hundred Allied planes bomb Mount Abbey and Casino. Wow! Die bombers, bombers, airplanes strafing Germans and stuff. That that is one of the great things I ever saw during the war. I'll I never bet. forget that. So how long did you lay there and watch them? All day long. All day long. Oh, the fire flight all day long till dark. That's amazing. And so then uh, instead of pushing out of Anzio and pushing the Germans, the Germans weren't there. There weren't many Germans there when they bombed them because they had moved out back out of the way. Right, because we were chasing the Germans all the way north. All the way north. So they took our outfit and took us over to the Adrian coast at the, below Anzio. Yeah. Anzio was surrounded by Germans. One more thing about Mount Abbey. Up in the mountain there where, where the Abbey was, they had a railroad track coming out of the, dug back into the mountain, had a rail car in there with a cannon. Oh. oh that's, you know, a great big one on a, on a rail car. Right. <laughs> they were shooting that. They didn't. They might have shot at us, but they were shooting arrow bursts at us. That's where the shrapnel come from. Wow. From an arrow burst. Scared. I tried to dig a dang fox hole with my fingernails. Scared the hell out of me. I bet it did. Boy, I was scared. So how did you, how did you and your buddies deal with the fear? Fear? Yeah. We were scared most of the time because like 550 straight days of being shot at in, in battle. And, uh, and is that day and night, or is it mostly well, when they Yeah, fire? it was both day and night. That's why we had foxholes. Right. That's why we dug in. How many foxholes do you think you dug while uh, you were there? I don't know. A lot? No, not a whole lot. Yeah. Oh, maybe half a dozen. Yeah. I remember one at one place we was at. I don't remember the places we were at, but it was sandy and it was so easy to dig up. Because we had them little shovels, you know. Right. So, <laughs> but uh, then we left. We left. We went to the, over to the Adriatic, and we. I never forget that night either. You could hear German shells whizzing over, and our gun shooting toward Anza. We broke in the Anza and opened it up. They also had a a rail, railroad that they had a. A flat car on it, had a cannon on it. They were shooting at our troops with that, the Germans were. <laughs> so we pushed, we pushed, we moved. We'd move almost every day for a week or so, pushing the Germans, cook, stopping cooking out of the back of a truck. Then uh, our, some of the officers were going out, setting up a gun replacements every day. They'd come back in, we had to get up and cook and feed them. Of course, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, they, they say the army travels on its stomach. Yeah. So that's an important well, thing is to keep them fed. We had this guy, this Henry Marcoux, he was a Frenchman, Canadian, but he was an American soldier. The one I met in Mississippi. In right. Canada. And, uh, was that your really good friend you're talking about? My best friend. Yep. Yeah, my number one friend. He came to see me after all over and over from Montreal. Nice. That's great. Some of my best friends I made when I was in the service. Some of my best friends I made while I was in the Navy. Yeah. So I know what you mean. So um, what kind of food did you cook? <laughs> well, uh, we got the, the, the uh, one, I'm not talking about a sergeant being tough. We had one guy who was a, it was a lieutenant, was a highway patrolman in Mississippi. He was the best guy in the world. He was like one of us. He, you know, you had, didn't have to be careful without him because he was real nice. He was a supply sergeant. They go back off the front and go down and bring the supplies in. <laughs> Henry and I, when we were on duty every other day, we would have the choice of the meats. Well, we could slice the meat up, roast beef and steaks and stuff. We fed good because he was a good cook. 
I learned an awful lot from him. And, uh, but we always had a choice of a good steak. <laughs> I, I took care of the stoves. I, I repaired all the stoves. And they were all gasoline, you know. Yeah. And uh, so I had an extra parts and I made up a stove. And, I, and we had a little, uh, little officer's tent and we had a box on outside the tent at this last place before the last war. Last, I mean, last battle. And uh, I, I dug a hole in the middle of the tent and I made a, got some wood and made a cover for it where I couldn't see it case of an inspection. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and instead of taking cooking our food dead, we cooked that out there at night. You know, the special. Yeah, that's nice. Well, not every meal was a special like that, but. Right, yeah. But my job, the first thing in the morning, get down and get the stoves going was before daylight, and then a 20 gallon garbage can, I made the coffee. 20 gallons? 20 gallons. I had, a, I had a great big white sack that I had the coffee in and I'd tie it up and hang it down in there and boil the water. Wow, that's <laughs> a lot of coffee. Yeah, that was coffee. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't, I didn't have to do any K-Peak or nothing like that. No, not, no clean up, but clean up the kitchen itself. And then well, him and I served the officers at one time too, a couple of different places. Yeah. We worked our way up uh, up above Florence, Let's get you out. and uh, I'm sorry. No, you're doing great. Up, up above Florence, and that's where we stayed for 1944. Christmas time, I'll never forget that. I, everybody got packages from home, care packages or something. Right. My mother went to Detroit to the to the delicatessen, Jewish delicatessen, and got all kinds of food for me. You know, I like cheeses and stuff like that. And that's the first time I ever tasted an anchovy. There was about eight of us guys at Christmas time. Yeah. We pooled our food and we couldn't have any lights on, but we had lights in the tent where you couldn't see them. Now, not, not all Germans were Nazis. That's there, right. There was, good, there was good people there, because we found that out when we got the prisoners of war that do all the dirty work for us and everything. <laughs> and uh, we got together on Christmas Eve, the Germans didn't fire at us, and we didn't fire at them until the next day. So we really had a party. Oh, Henry and I, we baked uh, never, yeast rolls. That was a delicacy, because you had old bread brought in, you know. <laughs> what was it like after so many 500 days or so of being fired on, you have a day where you, no one's trying to kill you. We, what was that like to have a day where no one's trying to wonderful. kill you? There was five days, six days. I think the paper said six days that we weren't, were in, we weren't do shooting. They took our outfit. We were way up in, up in, uh, I don't know, Italy somewhere. We pulled in an old farmhouse and uh, there was a creek running through the area and it, it was spread out and went like that there and there was a little island in there. Henry and I, <laughs> we set up our, we didn't have to take a foxhole there because we were down down low. We set our tent up there. and <laughs> On the island? On the island. We went away from everybody anyway and we're not gay. You know? No, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're making me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, we were away from the officers and everything. Right, no, I'm totally with you. All right, we got orders to leave there and go back down to Naples to get on ships to go to the invasion of southern France. Right. So that was six days we went down, to got down to Naples, and General Mark Clark wanted us back on the 5th Army front. We went back, that was six days we weren't in battle of the 550. We went back in there, going back to the that same. Must have, that must have felt, those six days must have been felt like you were oh, on the top of the world yeah. on the vacation, I mean. You were safe. Yeah. And then we got, like I said, we got to this one place. Uh, now we had, uh, of all the times, I mean, the colonel had to have an inspection. 
And like I said, we had a tent out there on the side of the hill hanging down like this. The Germans were there on that other side of the hill. The roads come around the hill like this. We were down off there in a tent. And we had the fox hold on each side of the tent. His was one mine on the other. And when we weren't being shelled, we were, we were slept in the tent at night. The Germans spotted a Red Cross truck coming down the road. And every minute they had them, had time that every minute they knew where the, they were there before we were, the Germans. They knew the land, the lay of the land. We had to go in there and right. find it out. And anyway, they followed this truck and they shot, shooting at him every minute. When it was around the other side of the hill, the shell hit behind the truck and one guy got hit, shrapnel went behind his ear and killed him. Another one of them ever came, they came into our outfit because we had a doctor there. We were on the road anyway, an old building. And he come in and showed me where the shrapnel tore his shoe off and stuff like that. Well, at that, that shell after that one there, they say you can't hear the shell that hits your belt. That's a lie. Yeah. Because I, I was out there straightening up the tent for the inspection and uh, I heard the strangest sound. I either automatically dove for the ground or concussion. Not me now, because it hit up on the top of the hill, up above the tent up here. And if I hadn't have been down, the shrapnel would come through the tent, a lot of this here, tore the top of the tent all to pieces. Wow. I was down below. <laughs> I hope, I got up out of off there. It was ice and pathway down to the building where the kitchen was. I got up, opened the flap of that tent, looked down there, and there was three or four of the Buddy soldiers standing down there to see if I'd been hit. You talk about a damn Yankee running, mister. I made it down there awful quick. <laughs> and that's where this piece came from? No, that one came out of the casino. Okay, I 